evening workshop. My name is Matthias Staudacher. I'm a local PI here of SageX. Uh, and I'm organizing uh, this conference to, together with uh, my colleague Johannes Brödel and my colleague uh, Jan Plefka. Uh, just a few words on, um, on SageX. Uh, I guess many, there are many SageX members here, but there's a few people from outside who are not familiar with SageX, so just a few words. Uh, SAGIC is an innovative training network funded by the EU to train 15 outstanding young researchers in scattering amplitudes. Uh, it's a 4 million euro grant. And uh, it, uh, um, of course, it's basically a credit school, even it's, if it's not officially called a credit school. And uh, <coughs> it, uh, on top of that, it uh, provides scientific training, uh, including schools such as this one here. Um, then we also do some outreach uh, training and activities where we make a film and uh, an exhibition. Uh, and um, it's also, wherever possible, open to non sagic students. So I, I do notice that uh, uh, luckily uh, there are uh, some. And I, I think actually somehow we expected more people. I think some people are still arriving currently. So that's why. Um, <clears throat> and then it also provides some soft skill training and some industry secondments. So the scientific goals are written here. It uh, goes all the way from math to, to uh, phenomenology. So on the math side, we explore geometric, algebraic, and algorithmic structures at the heart of scattering theory. Uh, then the centerpiece is the refinement loop cal calculations, identifying, exploiting universal scattering ideas with the most explicit predictive strengths. So it's either Feynman diagrams or more sophisticated techniques, which you will learn about in the school. And then certainly the goal is, apart from understanding <coughs> this uh, universal mathematical uh, structures underlying scattering, also the goal is to provide insight and tools to make lasting progress on problems relevant to current and near future colliders, which explains the name of SAGEX. Uh, so I will not read all the numbers. There's, uh, these are on the left side are basically uh, the, the scientific institutions uh, which have uh, hired uh, ESRs, early stage researchers, so basically the graduate students. And then we also have a, a number of, quite a large number of private companies uh, with a spectrum all the way between Maersk Tankers, the Danish <laughs> tanker uh, company, then uh, um, uh, things like Wolfram and MapleSoft for uh, computing, and then also outreach companies and film companies. <clears throat> so just a little announcement for future activities. Uh, uh, there will be a third. This is the second in a row. There was uh, last year in, in July was uh, the first edition in Hamburg. Maybe, I mean, the ESRs went, and maybe some of the some of the non sagex members also went to Hamburg. Uh, so there will be a third. Uh, SAGEX training school uh, with uh, this dates, which is again open just as the previous two editions to a limited number of external participants. So if you like this one, you can also apply to this one. Uh, and then there will be also a European study group with industry um, where you we make contact with some uh, private sector companies. And finally, I want to just briefly mention uh, recently uh, a website was created, www.amplitudes.org, which collects uh, um, sort of exciting progress in, in amplitudes research. And uh, why don't you just, uh, it's very easy to remember, why don't you uh, check it out um, at some point and, and, and have, have fun with this website and maybe contribute. OK, so now I think we are ready to, to start. And we have an exciting program, uh, uh, which well, was provided to you with five speakers, uh, very prominent speakers. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, our first prominent speaker, Lance Dixon. Uh, I, he's been, um, he's uh, through Slack also um, uh, participating uh, in, in, in SAGEX. And, and um, he's uh, one, really one of the leaders of the field. And uh, many of, of you, he, he is also very consistently comes to our events, which is great. So he's really living this partnership. And, uh, uh, and um, I've, uh, he was introduced uh, several times, so I will basically not introduce him much, uh, uh, that, uh, other than saying that he's really, uh, uh, we are very happy to have such a, 
leading figure in the field to give the first uh, lecture, which is kind of also a bit of an overview of lecture. And the, the great thing about Lance is that he really, in his research, is uh, covering the whole range of SAGEX all the way from very mathematical theoretical structures to hardcore phenomenological computations. So Lance, now I give the word to you. So how's the uh, mic back there? Everything okay? And how about the recording? All right. And we have all the acknowledgments in place. Okay. Guess we're set to go. So greetings to you. I'm uh, fresh from California. So you may notice a little bit of jet lag here and there. Hopefully it won't be too bad. But uh, I feel like I'm coming to you from Geneva because You'll notice that SAGEX, two of the five uh, letters in SAGEX are E and X, which stands for experiment. Now, it's my understanding that in the first training school, there wasn't any discussion of experiment. But tell me if I'm wrong. Did anybody talk about experiment in the first SAGEX training school? Great, I have it all to myself. So, uh, I mean, the goal of these four lectures are to give you some idea of how scattering amplitudes make contact with experiment. But the goal of the first lecture is just to talk about experiment. So we're going to kind of work our way into the femto world from the uh, apparatus that experimentalists use to actually detect particles and deduce truths about nature. Because without experiment, scattering amplitudes is some very beautiful mathematics. It's only when it makes contact with experiment that we get to call it physics. And uh, <clears throat> so if you guys uh, have any questions, please interrupt at any time. I'm using slides because there's lots of pictures of, and plots in this first uh, uh, lecture. But uh, I hope that I don't go too fast and you guys uh, slow me down in case I do. So the goals of this first lecture are to give you some kind of feeling or intuition of what events are like at the premier energy frontier machine that we have operating right now. It's the LHC, or Large Hadron Collider, because it collides protons, which are uh, examples of hadrons, strongly interacting particles. And in order to get a feeling for what happens at the LHC, we need to know what, what are the dominant particles that emerge from the collisions? What are their properties? How long do they take to decay? Some of them decay in microseconds, but that's still long enough that they are effectively stable on the time scales for the LHC detectors. And then uh, we want to know how they interact with matter, because only through their matter interactions can we measure them in the detectors. And uh, so there's issues of how you identify different types of particles, which I'll try to sketch a little bit about. And uh, we'll talk about what physics dominates the collisions and uh, the need to reject it to look for other types of physics because there's a very hierarchical set of different types of events that uh, occur at the LHC. And uh, we'll also talk about need for triggers. And I'll say a little word about, a few words about uh, the Higgs boson. This is my Higgs boson discovery t-shirt, by the way. So maybe you're used to seeing the Higgs boson as a bump, but here it appears as a prominent dip twice. Uh, this is just an inset. But the dip is in the probability of a fake. So you're comparing a standard model without the Higgs to the standard model with the Higgs. And at some point, the probability of the standard model without the Higgs becomes extremely small indicating that the data was inconsistent unless you added the Higgs. So that was all uh, around 2012. Since then, we have a lot more information about the Higgs. I'll mention a few things about that today as well. So this is the uh, 
the stage for this lecture. It's the Large Hadron Collider. Most of you have seen uh, pictures of it before. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. It straddles the border between France and Switzerland. And so if uh, one of those two were to leave the EU, then there would have to be passport checks for the protons at every single time they crossed, which would take a while. <laughs> so uh, that's the Geneva Airport for scale on the right. And uh, <clears throat> so there you can also see some smaller rings. It's uh, necessary to uh, inject uh, particles into a storage ring and then accelerate them up. They don't like to live somehow in a ring that's sort of too big for them. So it's uh, more efficient to first inject them into smaller rings. And you can see one there. That smaller ring is where the W and the Z bosons were discovered back in the 80s. And now it's an injector into the larger ring, the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, <clears throat> there are four major experiments arrayed around the ring. But we're not going to talk about, uh, we're mainly going to focus on ATLAS and CMS. But just for completeness, Elise over here on the left is specialized for uh, colliding heavy ions, which the LHC does for maybe a month uh, out of a year of running. Most of the time, the LHC collides protons with a center of mass energy of uh, currently around 13 TeV, going to 14 TeV when it comes back from the next shutdown. But some of the time, it collides heavy ions. Uh, and those collisions are done uh, in a different mode where the uh, collision rate is much lower because the individual collisions are, are very uh, copious in particle production and they couldn't handle, handle the same collision rate they have for the protons. And they're looking for different things. So at least mostly only operates when they're colliding heavy ion collisions, I believe. LHCB is a device that's uh, specialized in studying the uh, quarks containing, uh, the mesons containing the B quarks and their decays. And so it's sort of like a forward half of, of a generic detector. It doesn't surround the entire interaction region, but it catches B mesons that fly forward. But it also does a fair amount of physics that has some overlap with ATLAS and CMS. But it doesn't, uh, it runs when ATLAS and CMS are running on proton-proton collisions, but it doesn't get the same collision rate because, uh, as we'll see, uh, the, well, the kinds of physics it does cannot uh, tolerate having such a high collision rate. So this rate is, well, I said seven times greater, but this might be an old slide. It may be higher than that. Uh, sorry, that's the energy. Luminosity, yeah, about 100 times greater or the collision rate than the previous machine. The previous uh, energy frontier hadron collider was called the Tevatron, and it ran at about 2 TeV center of mass. And uh, it discovered the top quark, for example. So, so this is the uh, stage for where we're going to be. And this is a view of the Atlas detector when it was in the middle of construction. So the inner part, that all that space there was eventually filled in with the Atlas inner detector. And there's a person there standing there for scale. And uh, you're looking along the beam line. So all these detectors have a roughly cylindrical uh, symmetry. And the center is the beam axis, which is always the Z axis, whereas the transverse directions are X and Y, although often use azimuthal angles and uh, polar angles. So what you can see is about uh, eight different gigantic uh, uh, <coughs> tubular structures. Those carry current to make magnetic fields. And the T in Atlas is toroidal. So they generate a toroidal field which winds around this direction. OK? That's actually unusual. The main part of most particle detectors is a magnetic field that points along the z-axis, sort of preserving the cylindrical symmetry and bending uh, 
particles in the xy plane. This bends them in a different direction, but and, and really those giant toroidal magnets, their job is only going to be to bend muons mostly. That's what they're going to see out there because when the inner detector is filled up with material, muons are going to be the only thing that make it out there, hopefully. So this is the other detector. It's the CMS detector. The C stands for uh, compact and uh, it doesn't look very compact when you consider how big it is. It's only compact by comparison with Atlas. Um, and the L in Atlas is large, so it's a toro toroidal large aperture spectrometer, whereas CMS stands for uh, compact muon solenoid. So the, uh, it has a very uh, large, uh, the, these detectors tend to get named after their magnets, although there's a lot more going on. And, and uh, CMS has a very large magnetic field that is uh, solenoidal. The field is produced by, uh, let's see if I can find a pointer here. Yeah, there we go. So the field is produced by coils here. So the current goes azimuthally and that produces a field that's solenoidal. That means it's uh, approximately constant along here in this inner detector. And then it uh, <coughs> comes out and there's metal causing a mag that can carry uh, the flux back through here. So it's sort of most of the flux returns back through here. And we'll see what that does to the charged particles a little bit later. And uh, this is sort of a more typical design with no toroidal magnets. And the uh, main feature of both detectors um, is that the inner tracker, the inner part has relatively little material in it. So it has a lot of gaps or low gas, low density stuff. And uh, in the old days, these inner detectors were called gas drift chambers. And they would take charged particles, ionize them, and then read out the ionization as it drifted to wires. However, that drifting takes quite a while, and the LHC has to operate very fast. And also, it needs to uh, be more granular to have more pixels. And so nowadays, nobody uses any gas in the inner detector. Uh, Atlas had some gas tubes for some specialized purpose, but they're all gone now. They can't stand the high rates. And so <clears throat> there's silicon tracking. So they will be things like CCDs or, or uh, some kinds of strips that record the ionization in discrete places where the silicon is. But most of it's empty space here. So it's sort of designed to give you a few places where you can construct, find uh, particles and watch them bend, but not make them interact too much. And then you hit this green region, which is called the crystal ECAL. E stands for electromagnetic. And so these are uh, transparent, uh, a kind of a glass, but it's a very heavy glass. It's like denser than lead. And that density allows the particles to get, start giving up their energy and most uh, electrons and photons will give up their energy in this ECAL. And in the end, you'll get light output that you can record and measure the energy there. But uh, other particles, hadrons, will interact a little bit later in this blue region called the uh, HCAL or hadronic calorimeter. And uh, <coughs> then here's this superconducting coil that makes the magnet, but at this point you've tried to measure most of everything you can measure on most of the particles, but there's still one class of particles that doesn't give up its energy very easily, and that's muons. And so out on the outside of every collider particle detector are muon chambers, and they are tracking chambers, but because they're so far out and things are expensive, they're, they're not as well segmented as the inner detector. So they, they uh, don't have as good uh, um, 
they don't have as many channels of electronics or output per volume, but they're still quite huge. So any questions about uh, sort of the generic uh, picture of a detector? We're going to go through the physics that sort of leads to these kinds of designs a little bit later. So this is a view of the actual CMS detector uh, from the end on. And uh, roughly speaking, I think the inner detector is in here in the solenoidal magnetic field. Uh, the solenoid is somewhere around this radius here. Could yeah. Could you say just a few words why, why it was decided to make a PP uh, oh. according to yeah. compared to any other? Well, OK. Yeah, this is a good, good question. I mean, there have been uh, various types of uh, colliding beam machines. First of all, the original particle physics experiments were all fixed target. You take a beam and you slam it into a, uh, a target, which is typically nucleons like protons. But as everybody knows from having seen it, if you, if you have a head-on collision, you get much more available energy release. So the center of mass energy, if you have a fixed target with mass M, and a beam of energy E, that's uh, S is uh, the total mass, center mass energy is. And, and this will typically be just one GeV. So that's fixed target. And then if you have colliding beams, then you get, uh, get uh, that S is uh, 4 uh, E beam squared in the limit that everything's ultra relativistic. So once the beam energies are above a GeV, this gets you to much higher center mass energies. And if you have a, a particle that has a, a heavy, heavy mass, for example, the top quark, you have to get above the threshold. So, so this could be any particle. So you want S to be as large as possible. So then you have uh, different possibilities. You but the real practical ones so far are E plus E minus, PP, and PP bar. And uh, so the, the issue with E plus E minus is that if you store the electrons in a ring, then there's a uh, synchrotron radiation that is an unavoidable consequence of bending them to keep them in the ring. And so the power loss um, goes like E beam to the fourth over the radius, it turns out. So if you only have a constant amount of power to deliver to the beams to make up for this loss, so you can put in RF cavities, radio frequency cavities, to restore it. But there's a limited amount you can do. And this is a pretty strong dependence. So the same uh, ring that the LHC occupies now was previously occupied by LEP. So that was large electron positron. And that had a beam energy of about 100 GeV. Turns out it was just not quite enough to, see, to make and detect the Higgs boson in the LEP era. Sad fact of history. Didn't know where the Higgs was going to be. Anyway, it's very hard to push it much further, although they did all sorts of tricks to try to squeeze a little bit more energy out. So to go to significantly higher, you need a much bigger radius ring. Now that we know where the Higgs is, there's motivation. And, perhaps building a future E plus E minus collider that can make the Higgs. And the way you make the Higgs the most efficiently in E plus E minus is um, uh, 
is by making an association with a Z boson. The Z boson has a mass of 91 GeV, the Higgs 125. So you really need to go, you need a little bit more energy than that. So you need to have, you could get a little bit less, but close to 250 GeV. Whereas LEP had a total energy of, uh, of 200, just a little over 200 GeV. But just to get that extra 50 GeV, you need a much bigger circumference tunnel than 27 kilometers. You need uh, more like 80, 60 to 100, somewhere in there. So there, there are multiple proposals for big tunnels that would both be able to give you higher energy in proton-proton later, but they would first allow you to make Higgs bosons in E plus E minus. Okay, so that's sort of where we are with E plus E minus. We're not in the current E plus E minus era. Um, then the Tevatron continued running a little bit after LEP. Um, and it was proton-antiproton. And it wasn't the first proton-antiproton. The first one was that ring I showed you earlier called the uh, SPPVARS. Uh, and that, that was a good machine for making the Ws and Zs. Now the question of PP bar versus PP is a little more complicated one. But basically, antiprotons are very expensive to produce. And so the luminosity of any PP bar machine is limited by how many antiprotons you can make. And it becomes a trade-off because PP bar is better in some ways. For a given center of mass energy, uh, th this PP bar will contain things like uh, up quarks that come from the proton that have relatively high momentum and anti-down quarks from the anti-proton or anti-up quarks which also have relatively high momentum. You, the valence quarks, the ones that you think of when you think of the proton, UUD, those have pretty high momentum. There are also anti-quarks in the, in the proton but they ha have much less momentum. So you could take a U and a D bar and fuse them together to make a W plus. And the fact that you had very, quite a bit of momentum there was the reason why the SPP bar S machine could make Ws and Zs with enough rate. That becomes less important at the LHC because the energy is much higher. This machine had an energy, if I remember it right, it was 540 GeV. Whereas the LHC was, it has run at 7,000 to going up to 14,000 GeV. And I'm going to show you later some proton, uh, parton distribution functions and then we can come back to this issue. But basically you don't need uh, to have it be PP bar for the LHC and the menu of physics you can get is much better when you can get to very high luminosities because you're no longer limited by the ability to produce antiprotons. Good question. Any others? Okay, so this is mostly just to show you that these detectors are really an incredible engineering accomplishment. They're sort of like shipbuilding in their scale, but you have to know where every part of the ship is to microns in order to uh, track charged particles through it to high accuracy and, and measure their properties. Um, and um, of course it takes a huge uh, crew to run a battleship and there are 3,000 collaborators each roughly in both ATLAS and CMS. This is just an example of some of the uh, readout electronics associated with some of the detectors that are located closest to the beam if I'm not mistaken. So the LHC because it's not limited by antiprotons, it has huge uh, luminosity, huge collision rates. So about 40 million times a second, every 25 uh, 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 nanoseconds, there's a, uh, a collision of two bunches in the, at the LHC. This is a view of the Atlas detector showing all the charged particles that come out in that collision. It's not just one proton colliding with one other proton. At the 
luminosities that are achieved now, uh, each collision has about 20 to 60 simultaneous proton-proton collisions. This is an inner uh, zoom in of the central region. So this is a, sort of the canonical detector event where you look down the beam pipe. And these guys are all going out radially or in the XY plane. And uh, <coughs> here's a close up of the same collision where these yellow tracks that are obviously high, high energy, they somehow punch through. They're probably a dimuon from Z's or something. You can see them coming out here. But you see all these other collisions, which you call secondary collisions. They're proton-proton collisions that have quite a few tracks. But if you were to trace these tracks further out, you would be able to see that they bend quite, quite a bit compared to the other ones. And so they're not actually very energetic tracks, but there are a lot of them. And they uh, pile up. This is all called pile up. And it makes the, uh, detect the job of the detector of figuring out what happened in the one interesting collision much more difficult. What does simultaneous mean? Um, I mean that in the same collision of, two bun of, of one bunch with another bunch. So every 25 nanoseconds, there, there is another collision like this. 25, every 25 nanoseconds, you get 20 to 60 PP collisions. And uh, they're not exactly simultaneous, but they're separated by a much bigger time gap. So, so this, uh, I didn't show the distance scale on here, but this is maybe a meet, um, I don't know, uh, <coughs> tens of centimeters to a meter, roughly. And, and uh, everything's happening longitudinally at about the speed of light. So that, you know, of course, what time it is depends on what frame you're in. But, but uh, anyway, um, <coughs> the time separation here is a few nanoseconds. And uh, yeah, so the bottom line is that if you have tracks, you can point the tracks back and tell which tracks belong to a good event as opposed to a boring event. But not all the information is in tracks. As we'll see, some of it is in neutral particles that fly out. You eventually learn about them, but you can't point them back and tell which, which one they came from. So that's a subtlety that you have to worry about. And uh, so, so this is happening at 40 megahertz. And you can't uh, store and analyze all that data. And so the amount of data you can analyze is more like kilohertz. So maybe 10,000 times lower. So you have to very, make decisions very quickly on which uh, events to keep and which ones to just throw away. And a lot of the physics is actually done in, the, in, this, in software in deciding which events to study. That's called the trigger. Any questions? So most of you know what all the elementary particles are in the standard model. And in some sense, that's everything. Every single one of these has been seen in one form or the other at the LHC, now that the Higgs boson has been discovered. And, uh, and uh, nothing else has been uh, convincingly identified yet either. And so the uh, rest of this talk is basically how, how do we uh, see these particles at the LHC, and um, what is their uh, uh, <coughs> what, what's their trace? And of course, you know that the upper orange ones, the quarks, they feel the strong interactions mediated by the gluons, and so they will. But the, those interactions confine all of these into uh, particles, the uh, hadrons that are the external particles. And then here are the force mediators, photons, Ws, and Zs, the charged leptons. As we'll see, if you're an experimentalist, when you say lepton, you only think of charged leptons. You call these neutrinos. And you actually don't usually mean taus. So these are the easy leptons to see at a hadron collider. Taus are much more difficult and treated separately. So if an experimentalist says lepton, he means mu or E, 
where she means he, mu or e. <clears throat> okay, so in a little more detail, neutrinos only interact through the weak interactions. The weak interactions grow with energy, but even the most energetic neutrinos produced at the LHC will never interact with the detector once they're produced. So all they do, the only way you see neutrinos is in recoil, the same thing that led Pauli to propose their existence in the first place, apparent energy non-conservation. Now actually at the LHC, you don't see the debris of the protons going down the beam pipe, so you can't use energy conservation. But the stuff going down the beam pipe does not carry any transverse momentum. And so you can use transverse momentum conservation. And so neutrinos are usually seen uh, in recoil in the transverse direction through uh, an I apparent imbalance in transverse momentum of the event. On the other hand, because nu e, nu mu, and nu tau essentially look the same, they're all essentially massless on the scales of the LHC, and so they're all indistinguishable. You can't tell whether you lost a new E, a new mu, or a new tau, except by possibly seeing its charged partner that was produced in its decay. Okay, so neutrinos are easy to treat in some sense. Uh, <clears throat> then there are the Higgs, the W, and Z, and these are unstable particles that all weigh about 100 GeV, and they tend to go into pairs of other particles. So the, uh, just for reference, uh, and the dominant W decays are uh, so these these are very hard as we'll see and, and these are uh, easy and these are also pretty hard and this will be about 20% uh, of the time will you get uh, an easy uh, W decay. About 10% for E, for e and 10% for mu. Whereas the Z goes to, uh, well, I'll be a little more specific, E plus E plus minus or mu plus mu minus, each of which is about 3%. Tau plus tau minus, about the same. And then there's uh, jets, uh, which in, I'll just, running out of room here, so there's QQ bar. Although part of that is BB bar, which can be distinguished a little bit. But you see that only 20% of the W decays are easy to find. Only 6% of the Z decays are easy to find. Um, <clears throat> and the rest go to jets, and w as we'll see, the jet part is very hard. It's buried in other sources of jets, hadronic jets of particles. Now, those jets come from, uh, they're products of having produced gluons and quarks in the high energy collisions. And the gluons and all the quarks, except for the top quark, uh, are bound into hadrons, strongly interacting particles. And that will be the mo most of what you see at the LHC, are these jets of hadrons. The top quark lives such a short life that it actually decays before it hadronizes. And uh, the decays of most fermions are all governed by almost exactly the same formula with small modifications. So I'm showing that formula here. And I'm showing it for the example of the muon. Like uh, most... Uh, heavy fermions, the decay of the muon is through a charged uh, weak interaction. So a virtual W mediates that interaction, changes the muon into its uh, neutral uh, lepton counterpart, the uh, muon neutrino, 
and produces an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. And there's a coupling G here and an MW, uh, two G's and an MW squared in the denominator. But uh, apart from some square root of twos, um, so we have a G here, a G here, and a propagator that is uh, off shell. So we get a g squared over mw squared and the amplitude, square it for the rate. But this is, uh, th this is uh, often written, mw is g times the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs boson. And so this will be uh, 1 over v squared squared. And this is all up to factors of square root of 2. This is often called g, uh, is, uh, g Fermi. So this is the famous Fermi uh, coupling constant for weak interactions. And since the thing you're trying to uh, produce when you square the amplitude is the decay rate, and since the decay rate has the dimensions of an energy or a mass, and because uh, G Fermi is um, itself is 1 over 246, uh, 1 over 246 GV, squared, and that's squared again. This has the dimension of uh, energy to the minus 4. So you need uh, five powers of the only other scale in the process, which is the muon mass. The electron mass is much uh, smaller than the muon mass, so you can neglect it here. That's going to be an important part of uh, how electrons interact with matter, too. So let me just mention this. Uh, there's a big gap between the mass of the lightest effectively stable charged particle, the electron, which is only one half an MeV, and heavier uh, charged particles, like the muon at 100 MeV, the charged pion at 130 MeV and the kaon at somewhere around 500 MeV. So there's this big gap here, which has consequences for what the electron does when it hits the detector, but it also means that we can neglect the electron mass in calculating this rate. And if you work this out here, you plug in this value for G Fermi and the muon mass over here, you'll find that the muon lifetime is about two microseconds, which seems pretty short. But remember that the distance that a uh, particle flies is actually at least C times tau. I say at least because most of the particles are being produced relativistically, and there's an extra time dilation factor. So the real distance should be C gamma tau. OK, but even here, uh, even C tau is already 660 meters, which is a lot bigger than the LHC detectors. So muons are considered to be stable at the LHC. It may be that they're stopped. It doesn't happen very often that you can stop a muon, but the amount of energy they release when they stop is 100 MeV. And that's pretty trivial in terms of the energies at the LHC. So, so these are, muons are basically stable particles. Now we come to the uh, light hadrons. The most copiously produced hadrons are the lightest. I didn't really say too much about how you really produce hadrons, but you have uh, quarks and gluons emerging from the collision, and they, uh, at one, once you uh, move that color a long ways from the production point, for example, here you have a Q and a Q bar, but this has to carry some color like red, green, or blue. And there are no asymptotic colored states. So the, the chromoelectric fields start to stretch into a, a tube, a flux tube. This is a qualitative picture. This is very strong coupling dynamics. We don't really, we can model it. We don't have a great quantitative picture of this production, but when the energy in this 
um, be because the uh, coupling becomes strong, the sort of phase changes. In electromagnetism, the flux tubes spread out a lot like this. And the force goes like um, 1 over r squared. But here, the force, when the, uh, everything's confined into a given tube, the force goes to a constant. The energy is proportional to the length of the tube, proportional to the radius, and the gradient of the energy is the force, and that's constant. Anyway, you can build up so much energy in this flux tube that it's greater than the rest energy of the lighter hadrons. And so the tube can break and you can get a pion here. Uh, that is to say, if you have, for example, a U quark here, you can pop a D quark out of the vacuum and a D goes this way. And you don't just pop once, you typically have hundreds of GeV of energy, so you make hundreds of tens to hundreds of particles in these jets. And so you get a whole set of uh, hadrons, and this popping, it doesn't move things transversely very much. It distributes the energy longitudinally, but transversely it doesn't do much, and so you get lots of particles coming out in a hadronic jet. So those particles include, and because the uh, popping tends to produce the lightest stuff, most of the time you pop out pions. With a little smaller probability, maybe one-tenth of the time, you will produce strange, anti-strange. So you'll get kaons. And even lower probability, you will get protons, things like that. Now there's a big difference between the neutral pions and the charged pions. The neutral pions can decay electromagnetically through the famous anomaly diagram to two photons. And that, because it's electromagnetic, doesn't require the weak interactions, it's very fast. 10 to the minus 16 is effectively instantly. You can't see, um, you can't tell that that pi zero didn't decay right away. <clears throat> On the other hand, the charged pions and the charged kaons they decay through the weak interactions, essentially the same mechanism as muon decay, except that quarks are involved instead. For example, a K minus has a strange quark in it. Strangeness is conserved in the strong interactions, so the only way for it to decay is to <coughs> exchange a W meson. This could actually go to, lep to electrons or muons, but here I just happen to show it going to uh, D U quark to make a pi minus and a pi zero. And uh, it turns out that these decay lifetimes are all about 100 times shorter than the muon lifetime, about 10 to the minus 8 seconds. And uh, partly because you get some factors of 3 from color for the pion case. Now the kaon is a little bit heavier, so you might have thought that that ratio of 3 would lead to a big difference. But there's a compensating factor here. This, this vertex also involves the Kibibo angle. In other words, the S is in the second generation of quarks, whereas the U is in the first generation. And there's a hierarchical uh, mixing matrix, the CKM matrix. And the first element, the relevant element here is the Kibibo angle, which is something like 0.2, but it gets squared. And that compensates for the little bit heavier uh, K on mass, or, yeah. So these all tend to be 10 to the minus 8 seconds. That would be a C tau of about 6 meters, but because of this gamma factor, and these particles are all relativistic, the charged pions and kaons are effectively stable. They eventually decay when they are stopped, uh, when they lose all their energy. Um, but they may have done other stuff first. But they make it out to the outer detectors. In contrast, if you have the next heaviest set of quarks, the charm quark and the bottom quark, those uh, decay much faster because of the higher mass. Now the bottom quark is, uh, binds into B mesons, which have a mass of about 5 GeV, so quite a bit heavier than this. Charm is in between. You might think that B mesons lived a lot shorter than charm mesons, 
but actually it's not true. They have about the same lifetime. And once again, it's due to this CKM suppression. So for the bottom quark to go to a charm, it's actually a much smaller angle here than the Kabibo angle. And so the uh, <coughs> bottom or beauty mesons actually have about the same lifetime as charm. So there's a host, co uh, quite a number of particles. Also, there are other particles like baryons containing uh, bees and charm. And they all have around picosecond lifetimes. So th those are uh, <coughs> lifetimes lead to C taus of millimeters and the more relevant thing, C gamma taus of order centimeters. So that means that if your tracking is good enough, you can resolve quite easily the difference between the primary vertex where the main collision of the two protons took place and the place where the bottom meson or charm meson decayed. And uh, so the inner part of the tracker is designed to measure those uh, tracks quite precisely and it gives rise to something called B-tagging. So here's a, a CMS event that was interpreted as BV bar production and these were quarks were actually embedded in jets like this. It's just that it happened to have a B quark coming along and then it picked up a light anti-quark and became a, a heavy B meson. It's not completely clear it was a meson, could have been a baryon. But anyway, these tracks, they're being extrapolated in from measurements that were made quite a bit further out. But that extrapolation finds a lot of tracks from a primary vertex, none of which are shown here to avoid clutter. And then just the tracks that didn't point quite to the primary vertex and uh, instead they join at a secondary vertex which has a long elliptical shaped air bar. <coughs> anyway, uh, in this case you could see uh, not only a secondary vertice, vertex but also a tertiary vertex because the B decayed first and B almost always goes into charm and so if you're lucky you'll pick up a charm decay. The B decays are actually easier to see because they have more tracks coming out of them than the charm decays. So this is a typical example of an event that we get classified as a B, a B jet. And so you can distinguish B jets from other jets with some probability. And that's important for a lot of the physics that's done at the LHC. This is a slice of the CMS detector. It's this view in the XY plane. The interaction point is over here. And this just is the overview. And we'll go into a little more detail on this in the next few slides of what different particles do in the detector. So <coughs> the, uh, the dashed lines are neutral particles. For example, a photon. Uh, will leave no trace in the inner detector as shown as dashed here but as we'll discuss shortly it will typically give up all its energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter through pair production and an electromagnetic shower. You can also have neutrons which are stable. They're, they uh, occasionally are produced and they will uh, usually interact a little bit later in the hadronic calorimeter. The uh, and here's that superconducting solenoid and of course the charge tracks are bent while the neutral tracks are straight. And uh, an electron here will have a curved uh, track and uh, interact in the electromagnetic calorimeter. So it looks a lot like a photon, this, these two blobs here. It's just one of them has a track pointing at it and the other doesn't have a track. And then uh, Charged hadrons, like pions, uh, will curve and, and end up in the um, hadron calorimeter. Whereas the muon does not interact uh, enough. And it will come all the way out here into the uh, uh, muon chambers, which are in between plates of steel that are the flux return. So any questions about that? I mean, the, yeah. Looks like uh, the green line is dashed, and then like it's, it's 
This one here. This this one? Yeah. Oh, down here. No, no, this one is not supposed to be dashed in the same way. It's just that it looks a little dashed because the yellow from the, the tracker is overlying it. But you see there are much bigger gaps here. So this is the, supposed to be the neutral one. And this is supposed to be red as the charge one. It just, uh, yeah. Yep. That's the, uh, because of the flux return. So the, this indicates the magnetic field and it reverses sign in the two regions. So in the central detector, yeah. Yeah, except the electron will never make it out here. The electron will get, if the electron had made it all the way out here, it would also bend the opposite direction. But the electrons are inevitably stopped before they get to the flux return. Oh, it depends on which, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the uh, muon and the electron, one of those should have been an anti. Otherwise, they wouldn't bend the opposite direction. Good point. And I don't know the sign of the CMS magnetic field well enough to uh, know which one is positron or anti-muon. But that's definitely true. At least somebody's awake early in the morning. <laughs> no, I'm, these are all good questions. <laughs> Okay, so now a little bit, a little bit of the uh, detector physics that goes into that. So most uh, charged particles, when they're not too light or too relativistic, they lose energy through one, one dominant mechanism, which is by ionizing atoms. And I'm not going to go through the derivation of this formula, but uh, the main thing is it depends on no matter what the mass of the charged particle is, there's a 1 over Me that's associated with the mass of the target electrons that are being knocked out of the atom. And then <clears throat> the main other thing to notice is the dependence on the velocity, or beta or gamma. There's a very, at, at uh, low uh, beta, this thing is not very important, and there's a 1 over beta squared rise. That's more or less because um, when you have a slow moving particle that has velocity similar to the velocities of the electrons, the field configurations change on about the time scale of the electrons in the atom. And it's much easier to kick out the uh, <coughs> electrons when it's moving slowly. So dedx, the change in energy with distance, is much higher uh, for non-relativistic particles. So, the, um, so this is supposed to be a pion here and kaon and, and proton, this is from Babar, which had particle, which could identify these different particles in other ways. <clears throat> and you can see that the dedx for always turns up when the velocities, when the momentum is close, getting close to the mass, that is the velocity is low. And then as you go to much higher momenta, the, this curve here, uh, this beta becomes one and you, your only energy dependence or momentum dependence is coming from gamma, but it's inside a logarithm. So it goes up rather slowly. Now electrons, since they have a mass which is a few hundred times smaller, they're already on the very high end or relativistic rise. They're, way, they're effectively way over to the right. And so they lose energy fairly quickly. But this isn't the dominant energy loss for electrons. There's another one on the next slide. Okay, but this is what most charged particles do. They, they lose energy to dedx, and all tracking uh, chambers work on this. Before, you used to get these continuous pictures from gas trackers that filled the volume. Now you just get discrete hits from silicon tracking planes that appear every so often in the inner detector. Any questions about that? So because electrons are so light, there's a uh, much larger rate of energy loss due to uh, the uh, uh, Bremsstrong. So Bremsstrong, instead of just kicking out a single electron from an atom, in fact, the electron sees the charge of the nucleus and it is uh, deflected, causing uh, a collinear uh, radiation. 
And this, this photon can be very energetic, although the, of course there's a range of uh, photon uh, energies, but this is the dominant energy loss for electrons and positrons. If you had extremely high energy muons, eventually that would be the dominant energy loss for muons. It probably happens around 10, 10 or 20 TeV for muons, I think. But uh, at, even at the, T, at the LHC, muons don't do Bremsstrahlung very often. So <coughs> the, uh, this is the mass of the charged particle coming in. Uh, and for electrons, you get a, a formula that involves some logarithmic uh, contribution depending on z. But it's mostly just going like uh, z squared, the uh, atomic number squared, and the atomic mass. And so you lose uh, energy exponentially with a characteristic length called the radiation length. <coughs> and um, so that's the, uh, that's a basic formula here. This Re is just uh, essentially mass of the electron divided by alpha squared, the classical electron radius. Because the radiated photons are hard, they, that you have to worry about what photons do. Also, of course, if the photon comes from the primary vertex, and the main mechanism that a photon gives up energy is through pair production. So it can, uh, in the field of the nucleus, you make electron-positron pairs. And the cross-section is fairly similar. It also involves uh, the cl this classical radius and, and z squared. So basically, electrons and photons behave very uh, similarly once they get into dense matter. You get electromagnetic shower. And the length is the radiation length, although this is usually given in grams per square centimeter. If you uh, divide it by the <coughs> uh, density in per centimeter squared, you'll get the, uh, in grams per square, per cubic centimeter, you'll get an actual length. So this is a, uh, a cartoon of an electromagnetic shower uh, with, a, say, a photon coming in and pair producing. But if you start with an electron or positron, it more or less looks the same after one shower development stage. And then you get a large number of electron-positron pairs. And the, eventually, their ionization is what gives you the energy transfer to the medium. So here comes, here's a simulation in, say, Jayant or uh, other, another uh, program, uh, Sven Menke. It shows all this pair production done in a magnetic field. So you see the lower energy electron-positron pairs curl up quite a bit at the end of the shower. And these showers are fairly uh, regular in that there's a, just a small number of processes that are controlling things. Of course, they fluctuate statistically, but not as much as hadronic interactions. So in the uh, case of hadronic interactions, essentially all total cross-sections for hadron interactions are roughly 10 to 100 millibarns. They get a little higher with high energy, but, but uh, and I and, uh, forgot to say that a barn is 10 to the minus 24 square centimeters. Cross sections at the LHC are often measured in femtobarns. So that's 10 to the minus 15 barns are 10 to the minus 39 square centimeters. So those are useful numbers to remember, too. And uh, since the typical uh, nucleon density in a, a solid is about 10 to the 24 per square centimeter, you can work out how long it will take to get an interaction. And that interaction length for hadrons is called lambda. So it's 1 over this nucleon density uh, and over the cross-section. And that gives you on the order of a meter. And, but these hadronic interactions fluctuate a lot, and it takes many of them to uh, remove all of the energy. And so you need, you, know, you need meters of lead or meters of steel plates to absorb all the energy of these hadrons. And you usually 
uh, put detector planes, active detectors in, in the middle, like steel plates or something, separated by some kind of active detector uh, to make a hadron calorimeter. Atlas uses a very dense liquid, liquid argon, and so it's completely active. Well, no, sorry, it, ha it also has uh, some uh, copper in there, too. Anyway, that, that's sort of the, one of the main reasons the LHC detectors are so massive. They also need to be large to uh, bend uh, charged particles enough to tell what their momentum is. But that's the second story. So this is a picture of a hadronic shower. And uh, <clears throat> a hadronic shower always has an electromagnetic shower bur buried inside it. Because these hadronic interactions of, of uh, pions, neutrons, etc., with protons, they often produce pi zeros. And so then those decay to two photons right away, and those photons start an electromagnetic shower. So there's always an electromagnetic shower buried inside a hadronic shower. And in general, there are many different production mechanisms, so it's much more difficult to simulate, and the showers are much more irregular than electromagnetic showers, all of which makes uh, the study and calibration of jets at the LHC very difficult. So uh, here's an example of a hadronic jet, a pair of them produced at Atlas. And uh, there are all these other tracks. The white ones have nothing to do with the primary vertex. And they're very soft. You can tell they're softer because they bend more. So the bend radius depends on the momentum. We'll come back to that in a second. But but lower moment, tracks with lower transverse momentum will curl more. And these don't curl that much, but they're still softer than these very stiff tracks here, the red and green ones coming from the primary vertex. And, <clears throat> but most of the uh, measurements of hadronic jets, well, they're done partly out here in the calorimeters by how much energy they deposited, which is shown by the size of these squares in each in each bin. And then a very characteristic thing to do is to make something called a Lego plot where you unroll the cylinder of the outer detector. And so across here is phi, the azimuthal angle, and along here is uh, something like the polar angle. It's called the rapi pseudo rapidity show formula later. And, and then you just plot the amount of energy going into a given an eta and phi region. And you see uh, huge spikes in various uh, regions. And then there are jet algorithms we'll come to uh, a bit later, probably tomorrow, uh, that, that define precisely uh, how much of this energy counts as being part of a jet. But because the jet is a composite object made out of many hadrons and because the shower from any individual hadron is, has a lot of fluctuations. Trying to measure jet energies is much more difficult than other uh, energies of elementary particles that hit the detector. So the, yeah. I mean the, uh, you know, exactly what happens to any given hadron. You can send a beam of pions into matter and there will be a lot more different types of outcomes because there are different types of interactions. There are soft interactions where it will lose some energy but not a lot. And then there will be more inelastic ones that will, where it will give up more energy quickly. Whereas the electromagnetic ones, there's a limited number of different processes and uh, so, and they tend to, uh, you tend to get things happening faster so it averages out looks fairly similar. Sure. Any other questions about hadronic jets? Obviously there's no time to go into lots of detail. Plus I'm not confident. Um, anyway, uh, the job of much of the detector from the muon's point of view is just stop everything else. So that whatever emerges at the end is a muon. And so uh, that's because the muons don't have any strong interactions and they're too heavy to have Bremsstrahl on. So they're what we call, usually call minimum ionizing particles. They just leave this trace of, of energy 
both in the inner detector and then again outside in the muon chambers. So they're actually pretty easy to uh, identify because the uh, detectors are largely built for doing that. Uh, whereas electrons, although they look different from hadrons, are a little trickier to uh, distinguish from the much more copious hadrons. <clears throat> so once you identify a track as a particle, you also need to measure its quantities. In particular, you know from where it appeared what its angle is with respect to the primary, primary interaction. And since most of these things are massless, once you know the angle, the only other thing you need to know really is one component of the momentum. The, so the transverse momentum. The transverse momentum, uh, I mean, here I said the absolute momentum, assuming it was going in a circle, but even if it has, so, so it, it bends in a helix in the solenoidal magnetic field, projected into the transverse plane, it looks like a circle, and this should really be the transverse momentum, PT, and the radius of cur curvature from the Lorentz force is just PT over E times B. The problem is that when this P is very large, which can be TV for muons, uh, th this uh, curvature radius uh, gets very large too, and then it's hard to t even tell the sign of the muon sometimes if it's very stiff track. And then to measure the uh, momentum, you need to measure this bend. And you usually have a fixed uncertainty in measuring positions. And you need to see the difference in these three points here. This is called the sagitta. And if this angle is small, then the sagitta uh, is like uh, d squared over r, uh, r times theta squared, roughly, cosine theta, small angle approximation. <coughs> and Therefore, the uncertainty on 1 over r is roughly a constant. And that means that the uncertainty on the radius goes like the radius squared. And since the momentum is proportional to the radius, delta p over p is like delta r over r, and it goes like r or goes like p. So the higher momentum tracks, you, don't, you can't measure the momentum very easily. That's the bottom line for this. For lower momentum, it's very easy. It, but at high momentum, you can also use calorimetry, at least for electrons uh, and for uh, charged hadrons. So <clears throat> the principle of calorimetry is very simple uh, from this point of view. I'm vastly oversimplifying it. There are different types of calorimetry. Some of them use ionization, like liquid argon. Some of them use scintillation light, like uh, the CMS electromagnetic calorimeter. But in both cases, the uh, uncertainty on the energy of the particle depends on statistical fluctuations in the number of electrons that are ionized or that come out in ionization or the number of photons that are produced. And uh, so that uh, means that the energy and, and this signal is proportional to the energy. So the fluctuations are proportional to the square root of the energy. So that means that the uncertainty on the energy and if we're neglecting masses and stuff, delta P over P is delta E over E, which goes like 1 over square root of E or 1 over square root of P. So that means that calorimetry works much better at higher momenta because you have lots and lots of, of uh, signal of photons or electrons and the fluctuation event by event is much smaller. Of course, you can't use calorimetry for muons because they're too penetrating. They don't give up much of their energy. You, you must use tracking. But you can use calorimetry for electrons and jets. And of course, for photons, there is no track. So it's all calorimetry. Now, uh, in the old days, uh, hadronic jets were all done by calorimetry. But uh, more recently, there's a new technique, newer technique called particle flow, which is more sophisticated. And the idea is that there are a lot of tracks in those hadronic jets, and you can use the tracks and the better behavior of the uncertainty from tracking to get a better measurement of the energy uh, by using tracking as well as calorimetry. 
You just have to make sure you don't double count. So the calorimeter will record the energy of all the um, uh, particles that are deposited into it. But if your calorimeter has enough segmentation so that you can see which clusters came from tracks, then you can use the tracker to determine the momentum or energy of the low, at least the low momentum charged particles. And then you remove those clusters when you add up the calorimeter energy. So it's actually, it's fairly uh, complicated to implement, but there are big gains to be had for the uh, uncertainty or the resolution, the average fluctuations in the uh, energy of a low, mo low transverse momentum hadronic jet. At very high energies, the calorimeter does a good job because there's lots of energy carried in high momentum particles. But down here, the adding the tracker helps enormously. So that is something that was, I think, pioneered more in CMS, but Atlas has also been doing it as well now. Um, and there's a sec another advantage too, which is that tracks, you know which vertex they came from. So there's a ho another, other whole issue of, of how do you remove the pile up energy, the energy that comes from other proton-proton collisions. Okay, so, uh, but even with all of these increases in improvement of resolution, you can still see that when you're at, say, 60 GeV, that would be the maximum PT of a B-jet from the Higgs boson. You still only measure uh, energies to not even 10% uh, accuracy. Whereas photons, for example, the Higgs also goes to two photons, you can measure it to one or two percent. So jets are still uh, hard to do extremely precisely. And the fact of the matter is that the LHC data is all dominated by jets. So uh, this is a, a, a plot that was made by James Sterling back in 2009, just before the, the uh, LHC turned on indicating just a few of the many, many uh, interaction rates that happen at hadron colliders and how they depend on the energy of the collider. And then since then, the LHC has collected data at 7, also at 8, and at 13 TV. So those are the relevant points to be at. The Tevatron was also shown for reference down here. But the total cross-section, as I was saying, it's about 100 millibarns, which is 10 to the 8 nanobarns. It sits way up here. And then the next sort of interesting process is B production. And that's also huge at the LHC compared to sort of the next interesting one, which is jet production or W and Z production. Jet production depends a lot on the energy of the jets, as we'll see in a, later. Um, <clears throat> but if we say jets which have energies, uh, transverse energies or transverse momenta greater than 100 GeV, it's still kind of overwhelming the W and Z production. And that's one of the reasons why W's and Z's are very hard to see when they decay to quarks, that is, to two jets. And so instead, you see them by paying the price of the leptonic branching ratios. Down here is top quark production. The top quark uh, are, give very energetic events. So they're huge backgrounds for many, many things down here. And uh, this is Higgs production. Now we know that the Higgs mass is basically 120 GeV. So this is the Higgs total cross-section down here. However, the Higgs likes to go to ways, to, to modes that are not very easy to see. So you have to pay further prices to see the Higgs boson. And um, so the bottom line is that there's a huge, uh, um, haystack of jets that you have to dig out uh, other types of physics and new physics from. And every time you get a single event like this, if you multiply by about a fifth, you get the same thing with one more jet. So all of these things are, give rise to many more processes with extra jets. Here's uh, an example of how the jet rates depend on the transverse momentum of the jet. And uh, <clears throat> all of these uh, turn out to be in quite good agreement overall. 
Well, you can make any agreement look good if you just put it on a log plot, but uh, this is uh, just next, next to leading order theory in green, agrees pretty well with the Atlas data. So what's shown here is, is the uh, uh, jet production rates as a function of the transverse momentum, but it's also binned in, in rapidity. Rapidity is uh, the log, one half the log of E plus PZ over E minus PZ. You can check that under a Lorentz transformation, a boost along the z-axis, this uh, behaves very well. It just shifts by a constant amount. That's important because uh, <clears throat> you have very little control over what frame the primary collision appears in, in terms of partons. So it's good to have things that have good boost properties along the z-axis. And this is really just a proxy for the angle when the mass of the uh, particles is, very, is zero, it becomes the pseudo rapidity, which is just logarithmically related to the angle like this. So you have rates in the central detector at small rapidity, and then these are like a y or a rapidity, a pseudo rapidity of 2.5 to 3 is, is very far forward. And, but they also measure jets uh, way out there. And there's this very strong uh, dependence on the jet transverse momentum, which is basically related to the strongly falling parton distributions in the proton that we'll talk about next time. Now I should wrap up. I think I'm getting pretty close to uh, the end here. I want to say a couple more words about uh, tau's and then mention a couple Higgs processes as an example. So tau's are uh, the heaviest lepton. It has a mass of 1.7 GeV, which allows it to decay like the muon into a lighter lepton. So it can decay to uh, electrons or muons. And as a, as a uh, <coughs> quick uh, homework problem, can you estimate this branching fraction for leptonic decays from the uh, uh, fact that the only other things it can go through are when their virtual W turns into mostly UD bar. So you should be able to get a pretty reasonable estimate of this branching fraction from that. But it's about 20% to each lepton. But over, you know, 60% of the time, it goes to hadrons. And these hadrons are very hard to dig out from, they look like jets, very, very low uh, multiplicity jets with only one, three, or, or five particles in them. But they're hard to distinguish from other hadronic jets, although there are techniques for doing it. And uh, <clears throat> so they're, those are much more difficult. You can use these leptons, but the problem is that you lose energy in the decay process. Only a part of the tau transverse momentum goes into the electron or the muon. And low momentum stuff is just much harder to do. But it's not impossible. For example, there is now evidence that the Higgs decays to tau pairs. And here's one event from CMS, which could be the production of a Higgs along with two forward jets in something we call vector boson fusion Higgs production. And then the Higgs uh, decays to these two taus, one of which goes to a muon, fairly stiff, straight track that's seen in the outer muon chamber. And then the other one went hadronically into some kind of a tau jet. So taus are doable but hard. So the uh, standard model produces all these different uh, processes. I only showed a few of them on that earlier plot. This shows uh, a large number that have been measured by Atlas in 2015. And uh, then there's a, and they include uh, W and Z production, but also production in association with jets, up to seven jets they've seen. The higher ones have larger uncertainties. There's also TT bar production, and a, a big group is populated here by double vector boson production. That is W's, Z's, and gamma's two at a time, as well as singly. And if, here's the Higgs production uh, cross-section and decay to various uh, modes. And now, 
we're getting into the area era where they're starting to see three kind of top or electroweak uh, uh, particles as well. And uh, <clears throat> that was just 2015. By 2019, there were uh, more measurements of triple electroweak uh, quantities, as well as much better measurements of, of pair production of electroweak. And this really requires a lot of precision uh, theory to go through, to, to compete, to make sure the theoretical error is less than the experimental statistical plus systematic error. I mentioned the, the trigger. I can't uh, go through all the uh, uh, things that have to be done to select events at the LHC, but there are various uh,